This video is brought to you by Squarespace. From custom domains to beautiful websites using their easily customizable templates that you can have up and running in minutes, e-commerce, email and email marketing, SEO, analytics, and scheduling, Squarespace does it all and has done it for us for the last six years. If you are a small to mid-sized business in any industry, Squarespace is the place to go for all of your website needs. Hop over to www.squarespace.com slash you for a free trial. And if you like what you see and want to move forward, receive 10% off your first order by using the discount code Hugh at checkout. Thanks, Squarespace. Hey guys, Claudia and I are in the middle of packing and about to head out to lead our Streets of New York photography workshops, but we just got this guy in yesterday, Sony's A7 IV. From Federal Express. It's a bit of a crunch to put together a full review of it, given that we'll be basically 24-7 doing street photography for the next 11 days, especially given the timing of the embargo lift and when you'll actually be seeing this video. So I'm going to limit my comments now to a set of preliminary but well-informed conclusions. Apologize in advance for doing less show and more tell than usual, but I promise when we're back from New York, I'll follow up with more details because we'll have more experience. But hey, bottom line, barring unforeseen circumstances, we're buying one to replace our A7S III. How's that for a kick in the head? Hey everybody, I'm Hugh Brownstone for Three Blind Men and an Elephant. And here's the thing, I'm just not going to take you through all of the myriad details of Sony's just announced A7 Mark IV, though I will tell you that it is an impressive list with real-world implications. Sony has not been snoozing. I will also cut to the chase right now. For most of us, it really is as simple as this, and why, as I just said, we intend to buy one. The A7 IV basically is an A7S III with a brand new 33 megapixel sensor. This is not simply a spec, hold that thought. A number of Kaizen style improvements and a few novel to boldly go where no camera company has gone before experiments, you might call them, or perhaps first generation initiatives that are very interesting, clearly indicative of where the company is headed. All for a lot less dosh. Specifically, the 4 uses an A7S III shell with almost three times the megapixels at what could be as low as two-thirds the price. Sony couldn't give us precise numbers during our briefing, and as I just said, I had to record this well before the embargo lift, but they did say then that it would fall somewhere between 2,500 and 2,800 body only, 2,700 and 3,000 US with the kit lens. More importantly, I think it's fair to point out that the body to which one compares the A7 IV, A7S III, or plain Jane A7 III, will determine whether you see the IV as a very real bargain relative to the S3, or a stretch that will make sense to some of us interested in a major video upgrade, maybe less sense to those of us looking for a major stills upgrade. I'm talking relative now to the basic three. After all, the jump from 24 megapixels to 33 megapixels is hardly the stuff of legend, especially for photography. It doesn't match the first, second, or third generation A7R series, never mind the current A7R4, and isn't being touted by Sony itself as offering any significant advantage in terms of dynamic range or IBIS performance. Then again, leveling up from an A7 III to an A7R with its 61 megapixel sensor and 5.7 million dot EVF will set you back $3,500. Moving from an A7 III to the 24 megapixel mega burst rate, mega buffer, mega autofocus performance A92 will set you back $4,500. And buying a third generation, third and a half generation, A7R 3A refresh will probably cost about the same as the A7 IV. At which point, one has to wonder if the incremental 9 megapixel advantage of the R3 over the basic 4 is worth it, or if the advances in the A7 IV, especially in the arena of autofocus and operability across both modes, video and stills, make more sense. In any case, let's give Sony credit. The company is taking a risk of cannibalizing its own product line before someone else does. Or perhaps Sony knows something we don't, that higher spec, more expensive cameras are simply no longer selling at the volumes they need, their target audience exhausted by the reduced gig opportunities for image makers across the globe, economic casualties of the pandemic. Or maybe the rest of the market is about to catch up. Or that we're approaching the limits of what traditional technologies can do. 
And the next S-curve really is all about computational imaging like we see on smartphones, and it has arrived. Duh. Of course, returning to the here and now, there is no such thing as a free lunch. And while you give up absolutely nothing except price in moving from the A7 III to the A7 IV and gain a great deal, you do give up a number of things that you get with the S3. And that's where we'll focus right now. Got a pen and a piece of paper? I'll wait. Ready? 4K 60p, no crop. 4K 120p, just a 1.1x crop. The 9.44 million dot EVF. Dual CF Express Type A USH2 SDXC card slots. ProRes RAW. Maybe modestly less performant thermal management. Maybe. At the risk of oversimplifying, for 99% of us, 99% of the time, that's kind of it. ProRes RAW really doesn't matter for the work we do. Neither do dual CF Express card slots, nor hours and hours of continuous 4K 60p. We never used 120p, let alone 180 on our GH5. Of course, your mileage may vary, and that's fine. What you get in their place, however, are these. 1. 10-bit 422 4K 60p in Super 35 mode, full with readout, no pixel binning, up to 200 megabits per second, but okay, yes, I'd prefer no crop, because the crop does mean one is likely to need at least one additional lens for the wide end, and will likely have to switch in the middle of a run-and-gun shoot, which is a seventh-level pain in the But let's not get piggy. The a7 IV does have 120p without crop, 8-bit 420, in 1080p. So how often do you need 4K 120p? Really? Two, a 3.7 million dot OLED EVF, which is a nice upgrade over the original a7 III, a more modest upgrade, but still very real over the same resolution, but older EVF of the a7 R3. Three, a few features in particular, which are showing up for the first time on an alpha camera, two of which have never shown up on any Sony camera, focus assist, focus mapping, and focus breathing control. And four, a new emphasis, as just intimated, on streaming. But hold those last two thoughts, because I first want to dig deeper into why I think the a7 IV should be recognized as a decontented, lightly decontented a7 S3 rather than an upgraded basic 3. Does the a7 IV, for example, literally have the same body as the a7 S3? By all outward appearances, yes, it clearly does not have the body shell of the plain 3. Does the a7 IV have the top plate recording button of the a7 S3? Yes, yay. Does it have the flippy screen of the a7 III? Yes, which you may prefer if you are more of a video shooter, may not prefer if you're more of a photographer. The grip of the a7 S3? Yes. Heat dissipation architecture of the a7 S3, according to Sony, hells yeah, which is why there's no official recording limit in 4K 24p. I didn't have the 80 plus degree high humidity days of last summer when I tested the A7S3 available to me to test the A7 IV in the last 24 hours. But since we now rarely shoot outdoors and when we do, it's for short B-roll clips, I take comfort in the fact that in the testing I was able to do, the camera stopped recording only after running out of space on a freshly formatted 64 gigabyte card in a little bit over an hour and a quarter and then stayed on until I got bored. The temperature was a moderate 73 degrees Fahrenheit. The camera coupled to our Sony 50mm f2.5 G running in continuous autofocus at 4K 24p 8-bit 420, which is where we shoot. Although there was an anomaly, the camera did shut down earlier after just 11 minutes, same settings, same everything. The only difference is that I'd attached Sigma's excellent 24-70 f2.8 DGDN zoom, which is weird, but... I will get to the bottom of this. Moving on. Does the A7 IV have the new menu of the A7 S3? Yes, but if you ask me, don't get all excited because it's still awkward as f I don't like SNQ either, though again, your miles may vary and that's fine. I was like the A7 S3. Yes, marginally better actually, although nothing to write home about compared to the competition in full frame and crop sensor cameras. 10-bit 422 internal recording, yes. No crop up to 30p, as I already implied. All intra, yes, depending on resolution and frame rate. H.265, yes. 
gyro data, yes. Cinetone, yes. CFX Express Type A, UHS two card slot, singular, yes. Because while there are two card slots and both accept UHS two SDXC cards, only one supports CF Express. Same autofocus performance? Even better with real time IAF and video down to F22, so that you can still use the 200 to 600 with teleconverters or shoot cinema verite at night on the streets. Oh, baby. You know what else is better on the 4 than on the A7S3 and regular A7 III, and the A1 for that matter? Ergonomics. The A7 IV has the best ergos of any Sony Alpha camera yet, which is not to say awesome. It's not Nikon, Canon, Panasonic, Fuji, or Leica level, but there is definitely less futzing required than before, and I freely admit, the camera's manual of arms is definitely capable of being mastered with time. I'll call that a win especially with the brand new Stills Movie s and collar underneath the PSAM dial, the key to the camera's much better operability across modes. The thing about that Stills Movie s and collar is that when you switch between modes, very easy to do, right under your index finger, your function menus and buttons operate per mode. The way it has to be said, a number of other brands' cameras already work. That is, video and stills can be set completely differently from one another, not just things like shutter speed, ISO, and aperture and white balance, but function menus, control buttons, and dials. And the camera will retain the settings for each mode. Just flip the switch and you're good to go. No more one one thousandth of a second in stills, then turn the PSAM dial to movie mode, and the same one one thousandth of a second again. Other uh, ergonomic goodness. No seventh level pain in the locking button on that PSAM dial, come to think of it, which, oh, by the way, worked in exactly the opposite way the exposure compensation dial locking button works on the A7S III. Although that button, exposure compensation, is now blissfully equally devoid of any markings because we can use that stills movie SQ collar, as I just said, to map wholly different functions to the controls depending on mode. Now let's turn to those three features I mentioned earlier, beginning with focus assist and focus mapping, the former showing up for the very first time on any Sony camera, the latter lifted straight from Sony's dedicated video cam version of the A7S III, the FX6. These first two are novel approaches to making focus pulls easier without dedicated focus pullers. Think of focus assist as DMF for video, and you are spot on. You set the camera by turning on focus assist, making sure touch tracking AF is enabled, and then, one, you tap the first object you want in focus on the screen, engaging focus tracking. Two, when you want to initiate the pull, override the tracking AF by simply beginning to manually focus toward your next subject, and then three, press the AF button on the back to pick up the slack. Why not just tap to focus on the second subject instead? I... Don't really have a good answer for that yet, but if you do, please let me know uh, in the comments section below. But you know what's really interesting? Comparing this Focus Assist implementation to the one on Apple's just released iPhone 13 Pro Max, I'd say the A7 IV is one or two generations behind the 13 Pro Max and one step ahead. As soon as the person in the foreground turns away from the iPhone 13 Pro's camera and towards someone in the background, this is in cinematic mode only, the camera switches focus to that person in the background, manufacturing shallow depth of field computationally along the way, which is brilliant. Between the two systems today, I'd rather use tap to focus on the Sonys for now, waiting for the iPhone 14 or 15 to play with a smartphone solution seriously. In the meantime, I'd urge Sony to expend its energy on accelerating its embrace of Apple's radical AI-powered computational thinking rather than this particular kind of incremental improvement. This is the next competitive landscape. There is another caveat I should point out. Focus Assist only works with lenses that support DMF. The second assist, focus mapping, this taken from the FX6, uses the camera's access to aperture and precise distance to the plane of focus data to compute depth of field and then graphically represents what's in focus and what's out of focus in front of and behind the object as it moves through the frame. For now, it's executed in a very 
clunky way, but the concept is unequivocal. The power of it is that you can see what's in focus dynamically better than through simple peaking, allowing you to better anticipate what you need to do and how much of it you need to do to maintain critical focus and when to stop focusing. But this takes practice too. Of course, you might ask, why not just make autofocus even better? Or you might mutter, get that f thing off my screen, because it does make it virtually impossible for some people to concentrate on the aesthetics of the shot. I really understand. Although the answer to why not better AF does seem to be there is a practical limit to what autofocus can do on its own for now and perhaps for the near future. And there is an enormous lens ecosystem out there beyond Sony's autofocus and glass, from oldie but goodie photography lenses to full-blown cine lenses, most especially, I think, anamorphics, that could benefit from this technology. In the right hands. Most interesting of all the new things on the a7 IV, to me, is focus breathing control. Because just like companies that have decided it makes more sense for software to correct for distortion and vignetting, rather than incurring the cost of doing it physically in the lens itself, Sony seems to have decided they can engineer enough focus breathing out of a clip with software to make focus breathing disappear as an issue, which is a big deal because a number of Sony's more interesting lenses like the new G52.5 that we have or the older but wonderfully sharp and compact Zeiss 55 1.8 breathe like dragons. And this now matters for what we do. There are two caveats, however. One, the software works only with Sony lenses. There is no third-party support. And two, the software works only with some of Sony's lenses. Most G Master Primes and Zooms, a few of the newest, fastest G lenses. And that's it. No luck for the 55 1.8 or my 52.5, as it turns out. Not the 51.4 either. The basic principle is pretty clever, though. Think of it as a different use case for the same technology employed in digital image stabilization, which at its core is a constantly changing crop. I've not been able to get an appropriate lens in-house to test this before we have to leave for New York. So for now, call me very curious about focus breathing control, though my instinct is that it is not yet at the level of software correction for vignetting and distortion. If Sony can perfect it, however, I think this just might be a competitive masterstroke at least when it comes to true hybrid shooters, because, of course, photographers don't care. One, it allows Sony to extend the lives of its latest lenses, in turn making it possible to slow down the pace, size, and cost of ongoing lens refreshes. And two, it practically forces third-party lens manufacturers to expend more effort, and that means money, engineering focus breathing out of their lenses the old-fashioned way through physics. Or camera manufacturers to follow Sony's lead. Again. Although the latest lenses from Nikon and Sigma in particular indicate that they've already done the work at price points that make sense to me, which is why I love their glass. In the meantime, since we're talking about glass, I'd really like to see a version 2 of Sony's 24 to 72.8. I suspect, I hope, we'll have one soon. Sony has just released their 70 to 200 2.8 Mark II, and by all accounts, it is clearly better than the first gen, though. I didn't like the focus breathing I still saw in the first independent reviews. I am very interested in seeing what the combination of a Mark II 24 to 72.8 coupled with focus breathing control can do. In any case, Sony's bet on software may be a smarter play in the long run. Maybe. There's more to the a7 IV, from the aforementioned emphasis on streaming to improve flash performance, including lower trigger latency, the ability to control the flash directly in camera, not the first time on a Sony Alpha, and the arrival of two new flash units altogether, and a bunch of other stuff I'm already too exhausted, and I just don't have the time to cover. More than that, flash photography isn't my jam any longer. I have no problem live streaming from the Batcave where I have gigabit Ethernet, and it's as simple as plugging in an HDMI cable to our A7S III at one end, and via an Elgato Camlink 4K, 4K Camlink, uh, with HDMI to USB-C adapter to my MacBook Pro at the other. And I don't want to be a vehicle by which you miss the forest for the trees, so let's wrap it up for today with this quick recap.
the A7 IV is shaping up as at least 90% of an A7 S3 at 60 to 75% of the price, with a real-world applicable, almost three times the megapixel count sensor, and a slew of minor but not inconsequential improvements, along with a few first-generation enhancements which indicate where the company is headed. Now that I'm winding this up, I suppose you could also think of it as, call it at least 130% of a plain Jane A7 III on the basis of the increase in megapixel count alone, although you and I both know that's very silly, at 125 to 140% of the price. Add in the dramatically better video capabilities, even if you only use a couple of them, and better autofocus, video and stills, better cross-mode operability, and whatever else floats your boat from the laundry list of refinements and improvements that Sony has put into it, and I think you get, even in this comparison, yeah, more than you pay for. Ah, the benefit of riding the manufacturing experience curve. Yes, issues remain from the menu system to the absence of shutter angle, which we really use, relatively minimal impact on image quality of an extra nine megapixels for photography, or especially the absence of high performance joy to use sub $1,000 Sony primes with Sony autofocus performance that don't breathe like dragons corrected through physics or software, I don't care. But for many people, none of this matters. On first blush, call the A7 IV the most convincing, most well-rounded, and keenly priced hybrid in the entire Alpha lineup, probably the entire industry. As I said at the outset, barring unforeseen circumstances, we're going to replace our A7S III with one. You've been watching how it does video ever since the cold open. Though my 47 megapixel Leica SL2 is going nowhere except over my shoulder for my personal street work. In the end, I think the A7 IV will be another hit for the company, putting pressure on every current or imminent sub-40 megapixel camera, mirrorless or otherwise, full frame or crop sensor at anywhere near the price, like Canon's $2,500 R6, Panasonic's $2,500 S1, Leica's $5,000 SL2S, Panasonic's imminently arriving, roughly $2,500 as well, Micro Four Thirds GH6, and Fujifilm's likely similarly priced, coming someday to a store near you, APS-C X-H2. Unless those crop sensor cameras, or perhaps next generation versions of these full frame cameras with this very same sensor are waiting just in the wings to turn things around. Now that would be interesting. This video is brought to you by Squarespace. For all of your website needs, Squarespace is the place to go. Hop over to www.squarespace.com slash hue for a free trial. And if you like what you see and want to move forward, receive 10% off your first order by using the discount code hue at checkout. Thanks, Squarespace. If you like what you've seen here today, please give a thumbs up, subscribe, join the conversation below because this is an incredible audience. If you'd like a copy of our Streets of New York, the book, head over to www.3bmep.com slash books. If you'd like to schedule a one-on-one -on -one video session with me for a portfolio review, explore or hone your artistic voice, select gear and more, sign up at www.3bmep.com slash booking. Finally, consider supporting our work by using our no-cost-to-you affiliate links down below, picking up some official three blind men and an elephant swag at 3bmep.threadless.com, sending coffee money via PayPal, or best of all, join us as a patron over at Patreon. However you choose to support us, as always, we thank you for it.